Django, did you test your slides? Good morning. Thank you. You're my favorite person in the room. Thank you. So uh, welcome back to an exciting, uh, I guess, fifth day of the conference now. We've been here since Sunday. Um, and thank you for your participation, your attendance, and your engagement uh, in making it a wonderful program. Uh, it is our last day at the conference, but it's still a jam-packed day. We have some exciting sessions on research track, ADS, and uh, so please stay on after this keynote to attend uh, the sessions and, again, continue with your engagement for the program. Uh, and it's also my pleasure to introduce our, our last and final keynote for the conference, uh, Professor Shang Hua Tang, uh, who is a university professor and Seely G. Mutt Professor of Computer Science and in Mathematics at the University of Southern California. Uh, he's a fellow of SIAM, ACM, and Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and he has twice won the Godel Prize in 2008 and then in 2015 for, for the Breakthrough Scalable Laplacian Solver. Uh, he's been cited as one of the most original theoretical computer scientists in the world. Uh, and the Simons Foundation named him the 2014 Simons Investigator to pursue long-term curiosity-driven uh, fundamental research. Also, if that wasn't enough, he also is a recipient of several other additional awards as well uh, in his honor, uh, including the 2009 Fulcrum Prize, 2021 ACM Stock Test of Time Award, 2022 SIG uh, Karma uh, Test of Time Award, and 2011 Stock Best Paper Award. Uh, he, I'm a, with his collaborators, he also developed the well-shaped Delaunay mesh generation algorithms for arbitrary three-dimensional domains. Um, and uh, he has also worked very closely with industry, including Xerox, NASA, Intel, IBM, Akamai, and Microsoft, and has, is a recipient of 15 different patents. So again, uh, please welcome me in joining Shang Hua Tang uh, and to give a keynote on Beyond traditional characterizations in the age of data, big models, scalable algorithms, and meaningful solutions. Shanghua. So, uh, thank you for having me. And, uh, uh, you know, we're living a time of uh, great uh, change in, in, in computing. And uh, the change has been very rapid, right? Merely 30 plus years ago, when I was a student, uh, CMU told us that computer science has four major areas. And since then, the universe of computing has greatly expanded. And in that context, uh, you know, the research field of KDD has grown into a shining uh, galaxy. So <clears throat> this change has been enabled uh, not only by uh, the advance in infrastructures for computing and for data, but ha perhaps more so by uh, the, you know, the full spectrum interactions between computing and um, almost every other field and with the society, right? Like Millen's talk yesterday is a great example. So, so these interactions introduce very rich, complex, and uh, very often multifaceted data and models. And uh, in some sense, it's a great challenge to the field because it gets us beyond our comfortable room, right? It goes beyond our comfortable room, and, and sometimes, it also introduced data model, which can be exponentially large, right? Usually in computing, we're talking about the succinct representation. F just uh, take network influence, for example, right? So it is not a single layer uh, model. It's a, the interplay between two models, right? For example, there's a static net network, 
and uh, there's a dynamic process over it. And it's really this interplay that defines the so-called group uh, influence that uh, you know, allow you to cascade influence in a sort of sequence, but stochastic through the uh, network or through other interactions to create a so-called stochastic uh, social influence. Right? So if you look at most of those models, sometimes we study succinctly represented, like uh, IC or threshold model. But the fundamental model, the natural model behind it, is actually a big model. So for example, the mathematical information it contains really is about the probability of uh, a set that can enable the other sets. And it's this large probability profile. You can treat it almost like a, a power set network, right? Because it's a graph over power set. And even with minor reduction, for example, through KKT into the so-called uh, the, the, the influence spread, you take the uh, the value of the influence of a group. And that is still a huge model, exponential in size. Right? So, <clears throat> so this rich and big model clearly drive us to go beyond our traditional structures and, uh, and also try to identify perhaps more important solution concepts that uh, you know, uh, in a new space, hopefully it's mathematically meaningful, uh, algorithmically scalable and uh, experimentally justifiable. Right. So it is this change that uh, I think everyone embraced uh, wonderfully, and uh, because they do encourage us to think about new framework that go beyond traditional uh, paradigms. So one particular space it has really push us towards, because of big data and the big model, is heuristics. Right? I'm sure everyone has your own heuristic definition of heuristic, right? So everyone has their own heuristic definition of heuristics. So let me share a little bit of where I interact with so-called heuristic and eventually with some theoretical interactions. So it still taking me back to my CMU days. I went there in. 88, and I began to take the first class there called AI. They only have four classes, AI is one, and the other four are listed in my early slides. And it was organized by Hans Blinner, who write computer games, you know, expert in uh, search. And it was, you know, assisted by a few young faculties. Uh, and periodically, we have, uh, you know, distinguished uh, speakers uh, from the department, and many of them eventually won Turing Award, and uh, 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 visitors from other campers who used to teach at CMU, who sometimes also win Turing Award. And in spite of this sort of dream team of AI class, I barely escaped the remedial of this class. And, uh, and one of the reasons is actually perhaps is this notion of heuristics. So heuristic is really one word I learned from this class. And it's actually a new word I, that I have to look it up in the dictionary. So still puzzled, I went back to our leading professor, Hans Blinner, who expert in big model. Really, you think about back then, it's big model for search the chess program, right? It's a big model. And uh, I asked him, what is heuristics? And he gave me a I think hindsight is a great answer. You try to make in, uh, intelligent decisions that uh, when you're facing large information. So in fact, the heuristic become highlighted in the class is because not just Hans Blinder, multiple other faculties, like Alan Noel and so on, they all mention that uh, heuristic is the future of computing. <laughs> And uh, you know, to a theoretician, that's a, you know, I thought algorithm is the foundation of computing. So uh, still puzzled, I went to my fellow friend, uh, Feng Xiong, who eventually write Deep Blue, which beat Hans' uh, program for chess, and also beat human expert. And uh, he gave me a short answer, approach that worked well in practice, very direct. And uh, still unsatisfied, I went to my you know, favorite 
theory fellow students, uh, David Applegate, and he is more blunt. He said, those are intuitive, effective methods without theoretical guarantee. Okay. But it was declared to be the future of computing in the class by multiple faculties. So <coughs> I became reasonably happy with David's answer, and uh, I went back to my advisor and said, I'm so glad that I I'm lucky to study algorithm, not heuristics. And uh, my advisor, Gary Miller, who is a co-founder of Randomized Algorithm, did not embrace my idea immediately, but he said, hmm, think about it, randomized algorithm are somewhat heuristic, right? So, but it opened my eyes. Since then, whenever I go to talks, for example, uh, Randy Bryan's talk on BDD modeling, model checking, and his statement looked heuristic, right? like a beautiful heuristic. And uh, when I went to NASA later on, Horst Simon told me, that spectral partitioning worked well in practice. And subsequently, my other numerical colleagues, including Wei Ping, uh, mentioned to me multi-level method is a, a fantastic uh, method of optimization in practice. Right? So this began to lay out almost like a statement of heuristics. And uh, so when Aido invited me for the talk, this was my initial title and uh, my initial abstract, which is closer to the abstract I sent. But somehow I got a little bit conscious. That's why I perturbed my title into the one in the print. So I will follow this, this is a talk. <clears throat> you see, research is a process of knowledge discovery and data mining. Right? That is, we, uh, you know, we data mining the, the, the other writings of experts. And we get field, uh, feedback from field. So in fact, at that time in computer science, people are concerned about uh, heuristics. And the, the, the yellow part are the, my data mining of this long statement from a workshop report. And uh, when we go to the field, uh, people also give you beautiful answers of uh, what is a re why real world data is more kind. It's produced certain patterns and also they allow you to discover some very important elements, including one person said, the stock value is a good example of practical data. It has intrinsic value plus um, market measurements as noise, right? So, so the previous one, you can see highlight some of the important problems like simplex algorithms, the need to understand heuristics. And this one, if you data mine it, it said, the real data is neither worst case or average case. And it was all sta stated by other people, right? So, so we began to examine some of this heuristic we learned throughout our early career and began trying to see them in more theoretical framework. And uh, so the first one is a simplex algorithm, which is truly a heuristic, right? Invented in the 40s and used in the wartime has horrible theoretical performance, but brilliantly in practice. So this is called heuristics. And uh, so taking the stock value as a model, namely a data plus noise, and after a few years of work, Dan Spielman and I was finally able to prove the following result. That is, if you take any linear program, suppose what you receive is noise model. It's just slightly perturbation of that model. Then, if this is what you receive in practice, then actually the simplex algorithm takes polynomial time in the problem size and the one over the, the standard deviation of perturbation. So this essentially says if you believe your data has some noise or uncertainty, then sometimes certain algorithms actually work fast. Right? So, so this allows us to at least go a little bit, a small step uh, beyond the worst case. And, but we're still able to consider all the data and their surroundings. And by adjusting the noise level, we are able to interpolate between worst case and average case. And this at least gave some kind of correlation. I'm not saying to prove it. That is, uh, uh, data in practice are not arbitrary, but could generate by noise. Then they are subject to this kind of analysis. 
And uh, sure enough, after a few years, our postdocs are able to prove that uh, the k-means method, which is widely used in KDD field, for example, actually has a polynomial smooth complexity, even though in the worst case, even in 2D, it can have exponential convergence, right? So, so you can see this kind of gradient descent or discrete gradient descent uh, often are subject to uh, 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 a progress of noise because the noise limited the precisions. That's why somehow in practice you can make a good progress. And this has recently been expanded to many other local search, including binary CSP and uh, other uh, very difficult so-called polynomial local search problem. So they are also expanding into some other uh, areas, including multi-objective optimization. Uh, that is, you have multiple objective optimization with a very complex domain called S. This domain could be very complex and big. And uh, so in such a domain, basically, we try to capture so-called Pareto surface, which are the dominating solutions. And in fact, Pei Jian gave a talk at USC. He's talking about using the Pareto curve, what he called skyline, as a, 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 a way to interpret certain data mining algorithms. And this result states that in the worst case, the Pareto curve can be very big, exponential in size, even in d equal to two. But again, that in the smooth case, with noise in the objective function, there's no noise in the domain, objective function alone, that will drop the, 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 uh, the Pareto surface essentially to polynomial in low dimension. Okay. And uh, so naturally, you know, the other area has a lot of uncertainty and the noise is machine learning. And uh, so some of those began to find application, including the last two years, this sort of flurry of results, uh, particularly about the complexity of online learning. And in particularly, the, uh, the 2000 result out of Stanford uh, showed that uh, uh, even in linear threshold or neural network, they may have infinite little stone uh, dimension, which is saying that in the worst case, you cannot learn online. But uh, when the adversary is subject to a little bit noise, then suddenly the classification is based on VC dimension. So that's why ultimately, you know, you can see the title of the last paper just came out, that is to say smooth online learning is as easy as statistical learning, right? So, so, so it did create certain space for improving or understanding the performance. <clears throat> so, so the other area is, uh, I'm not going to go through detail because those require a lot of definitions. And uh, it find many recent applications uh, in the, uh, mostly the, you know, computing good tensor approximations, okay? So uh, I was outside in the book area, and uh, this book is there, and summarize not just smooth analysis and uh, other activities in theoretical computer science about so-called beyond worst case analysis, okay? So, so let me switch gear a little bit to, uh, tie with the beyond worst case, it, the noise is not the only way to quantify input clearly because our input in real computing could be very complex. It's very hard to precisely model them. And in some sense, we want to have a property that uh, the practitioners think is kind of correlated to, uh, to, 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 to the real input. And then we are able to somehow harness that to at least make certain mathematical quantification, right? So the other problem is, a beautiful heuristic called spectral partitioning. I'm sure here I don't need any introduction. It used graph Laplacian, which is derived from adjacency matrix. Those were firstly developed around the 70s. Okay. And there's different type of graph Laplacian. I think in this field, uh, I do not need to overly uh, emphasize. And uh, so again, you can see it has a very similar profile. Widely used in practice, highly effective, horrible in worst case, and solving hard problem, like NP hard problem. And when we began to ask people in the field why you think spectral partitioning work, particularly uh, Horst Simon, who really pushed for the spectral partitioning software. And uh, 
the numerical analyst said, you know, meshes in 3D or 2D or 3D, 4D, they are well shaped and they have limitations. And uh, uh, Andrew Kang from uh, UCSD said, you know, if you look at the VSI, the other area, the graph are mostly planar, or kind of planar, <laughs> right? So, so with those as a hint, uh, we were able to analyze some of those properties. For example, one of the quality we measure for a cluster is conductance. That is the amount of edges you cut divided by the total possible edges in that subgroup. And there's a classical result by Chigar connect graph Laplacian with the, uh, the, the, the cut size. It's basically say that the second eigenvalue of the Laplacian has at least a square root upper bound on the cut ratio. So with this, we were able to aim at these two uh, uh, quantification, planar or well-shaped. So we are able to, for example, to quantify the eigenvalues. And through the classical result, one can obtain, for example, for planar graph, they always have any planar graph has cut ratio one over square root of n. So this is almost like you cut a regular grid, right? Root n by root n grid has n nodes. If you cut in the middle, that's root n, and the volume you cut out is half n, and the ratio is one over root n, right? So this basically said all planar graph look like that, and the similar result extends to three-dimensional or four-dimensional measures, right? <clears throat> so, so naturally, you know, understanding heuristic is one thing, right? Like a baby try to learn language. At the beginning, they try to understand the language. Then they want to produce. They want to say something. And theoretician too, once you begin to able to prove a little theorems of heuristics, we also want to design heuristic. It's really a lot of fun. It's the future of computing, right? So, so let me share some of the experience along the way that somehow this uh, search it gave a rise some of several scalable algorithms, okay? So, so I will stay again in the domain of spectral theory. And it is also try to show you some kind of heuristic theorem that somehow is totally heuristic theorem that can actually be formulated, okay? So, 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 so let me look at the uh, uh, partition, uh, spectral partitioning a little bit in more detail. That is, we take the Laplacian, we compute eigenvalue, so eigenvector basically embed on the x coordinates. Then we somehow uh, swing a cut and try to get the best one. And uh, so this is a dimensional reduction in search space, right? The search space for partition is exponential, two to the n. And the spectral partition reduces it essentially to n and clearly lose a lot of information. You want the, the reduction to be reasonable. And uh, so Chigurh's inequality is that theorem somehow to say it's not too bad. You at least get square root of what you can get. And uh, so by proving the, that heuristics, we were able to begin to understand more of an early result by Lovas and Shimonovich in a convex volume approximation. They have an a, 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 a analysis of random walks. And there basically one of the statements is almost trigger like to say that you can use random walk to kind of achieve the Chigurh inequality, okay? And then I began to look into that and began to see that more as a heuristic of partitioning. Because at that time, we don't know how to compute eigenvectors in linear time or nearly linear time. There's no scalable algorithm at that time, right? So that's why we always look for alternative to see even heuristically. So, so what is this local idea? which is very close to today's big data analysis. That is, uh, you have this big data, you don't have it all. You may have some little accesses, for example, VPN in the Facebook, or I don't in the, face, uh, in the Facebook, and we only know their local connections. But slowly, either through random walk or through some other local visit, we began to see their friends, and we began to see their friends. So this is called a local uh, search. So locally, you explore a graph, or locally explore data. And you don't have to uh, get everything in. And naturally, if you keep on doing it, you see the whole data. However, the local algorithm try to make a decision before you see the whole data. So how do you compute without seeing the whole data? 
right? So can we get a decent cluster just by doing that without seeing the whole data? You, you, because we want to be scalable, which means in some sense this is one approach to be scalable. And uh, <coughs> since we began to you know, play with the random walk, a few other very gifted theoreticians and statisticians also joined the hunt. And uh, uh, by examining either random walk or personalized page rank or other very complex uh, uh, statistical uh, uh, sequence. And uh, eventually, we are able to uh, prove results really have some kind of heuristic statement, but they are totally heuristic with heuristic theorems, right? So here's the result. Uh, imagine that I want to uh, design so-called local clustering. And Juan Liu came to me. I knew Juan Liu first before anyone in this room because we were college uh, schoolmates. And uh, uh, so, so suppose Juan said, can you give me a good cluster around me? I, I compute the local time, and it's locally linear. Namely, I give him a cluster in time, linear in that cluster size. It's output sensitive, scalable. So he, he got this cluster. He thanked me. He said, how good is this cluster? Because it's heuristic, I will say, I don't know. He said, what can you say? You're a theoretician. What can you say about this cluster? I said, I can say something, but I don't know what you like. So he said, try me. I said, I don't know whether I can get a good cluster. Because if you're not in a good cluster, how can I get one? Then he, when I thought about it, he said, hmm, what if I'm in a good cluster? Can you get me a good cluster? Then I will say, I don't know. So you can see how heuristic this statement, mathematical statement is. I don't know. So then he said, what do you guarantee? I said the following. If V, like Huan Liu, is in a good cluster, this, uh, this C, I'm able to get you another class called S, which kind of approximates the C that uh, 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 follow the uh, conductance, except I can't guarantee for you I can guarantee for half of the members in that cluster. So in other words, if Huang is in a good cluster, I guess guarantee nothing for him. I give him a result, no guarantee. But for half of the members in that cluster, if I started there, I can give you a trigger guarantee. In time, scalable of output size. Right, so th this is the maximum state. Anything is not true anymore. This is the only time it's true. That is, uh, if he's in a good cluster, I can't guarantee for him, but I can guarantee other people, half of them in a cluster, I don't know which half, that I can get a good cut. Right? So, so this is, uh, I think, probably in my mind, one of the uh, first few, at least the heuristic theorem I formulated, we formulated and somehow managed to get approved. And it has some kind of connotation of heuristic because it didn't give you full guarantee, but it guarantees something, okay? So by looking into this type of heuristic approach, suddenly you see other problems in the landscape of heuristics. For example, here is a, a problem uh, we learned from uh, you know, Google and Microsoft at that time for uh, web search. So, so they want to compute the following problem. You want to compute it without looking at the entire network. That is, I give you a huge uh, graph, and I give you threshold, the delta, let's say n to the one-fifth. And I want to output all pages whose page rank is more than the threshold. I don't want any pages whose page rank is less than half of that. So as you can see, the maximum you can output is n over delta because the total page rank is n, right? So, so can one design algorithm of complexity n over delta? Namely, you don't see the entire data. You get all the important page ranks, right? And this, you know, sometimes the answer is only one node or two nodes. So that's why you can see it's a heuristic demand that, uh, you know, in the maximum I knew is at the most n over delta, but uh, can we achieve this complexity? So, in fact, when look at some of the creation in this field, KDD, dub, 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 and people have been studying this page rank, personalized page rank, for a very long time. And uh, so in some sense, you can use personalized page rank to assemble a matrix for each node. And this become my favorite adjacency matrix now for graph. I call densification of network. And uh, 
So, so this matrix, if you look at, at every row, this is exactly what uh, Fan Chong and uh, Anderson's way to do a local clustering. They try to get one row. And, uh, but if you look vertically, it's page rank. If you sum vertically, it's a page rank. If you sum horizontally, it's a stochastic matrix. A beautiful matrix for network. And uh, so this matrix has the following property. You can sample by row, but for each row, you can do this local random walk. So you can use a local algorithm in a sort of a, a hybrid with sampling. And in fact, we show that indeed you can just use a clever way to set up precision to be able to access this big matrix without computing them. And you can compu so solve the significant page rank problem in this complexity. Okay. So, so, so this is the power of a local algorithm, maybe with sampling. It may solve many other potential problems. Okay. And this is just one of the test examples that happened page rank satisfies certain linearity property one can attach with a uh, 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 random walk. And indeed, that uh, uh, in a few years, my colleagues, and then subsequently in uh, uh, a broad field of uh, network influence, people did find a nearly linear time algorithm for maxim uh, maximization of uh, uh, influence in a quite broad model called trigger model defined by KKAD. And uh, so what they did use, in essence, is just that different matrix that for one row you can sample and you can move up and down sample, but for one row you can do local estimate. So you can see this kind of heuristic thinking sometimes actually lead to scalable algorithms, even though the original statement look weak but they catch enough mathematics somehow for other problems they can solve. Okay. So, 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 so let, let me mention another example of which we, uh, uh, we participated uh, using heuristic eventually to design a scalable algorithm. And uh, this is for a notion called spectral sparsification, spectral graph sparsification. That is, uh, if you give me any network, now, any graph, if you look at a Laplacian, one can compute another sparse approximation of that network. And the sparse approximation has only linear number of edges, which means scalable. And you can, even though the original network could be much bigger, you can reduce them to almost a linear size. And this is just the, uh, if you can think as a special case. If you have a complete graph, you can use hypercube to approximate. And this basically means every graph has a kind of hypercube-ish approximators. And uh, uh, to prove existence, uh, one can do much less because you can use other way to prove existence. But to have a scalable way to do this, it, it, for a while, it's very difficult. And it, it turned out that the first algorithmic solution for sparsification came from local clustering. That this local clustering algorithm that I mentioned didn't make a quite that happy but actually solve this problem, it offered the first uh, scalable algorithm to solve for any graph, weighted graph, you can find a sparse network, the spectra are similar. Okay. So, <clears throat> so once you have this, it's tied with the other heuristics that uh, I think Wei Ping taught me first, or George is here. And uh, so essentially called a multi-level method. That is, uh, you have a big complex problem, you continue to simplify it, and you also build the mathematical map between those problems called projections. And on the other direction, you can interpolate. I use a very quote-quote notation, but you have to in detail build those operations. And uh, in fact, their graph partitioning code was written in this framework. Mattis was written in this framework. And uh, so, 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 so the first step, you try to course and uh, your problem to make them smaller, right? This is the only way we know how to solve a problem. It's uh, complex, we need to break them down, divide and conquer, or we want to quarter them to make them smaller, or specify them, make them smaller, right? So data analysis of big data is to make things smaller, right? And uh, so then we want to tie this hierarchy so that the solution of smaller ones, which we can do with more time, can be somehow moved back, and there will be a local improvement in between. Right, so this is a heuristic, 
and uh, for graph partition, it has produced amazing code. And uh, so this, if we use specification as a means to solve a linear system based on Laplacian, so this gave out the first scalable algorithm that for any Laplacian matrix, you can invert it in uh, almost a linear time. And clearly, this type of result has been greatly improved once uh, uh, the first one was discovered. It become simpler and simpler. Okay, so so those are all come from certain heuristic that uh, eventually evolve, have just enough property that you can solve another onions. You can build this kind of primitives, continue to solve broader problem, and the, the scalable Laplacian uh, enabled the solution of many other problem because people already reduce them. For example, spectral approximation, uh, planar embedding and the learning on network, and it's also uh, introduced new techniques to study uh, max flow and mean cut uh, in, in combinatorial optimization. And in fact, as I'm speaking, uh, Fox just announced that uh, this year's best price go to the big breakthrough for uh, uh, max flow and mean cut. And now they can solve it almost in linear time. And, and to the power one point, one plus epsilon. Totally amazing. Six young people came through with advanced data structures, iterative algorithms, and many layers of uh, analysis, and it went 100 pages, yeah. <clears throat> so I think uh, big data is a good thing for algorithm design because uh, it so suddenly makes us unsatisfied with polynomial time characterization. Right? For very often now, in theory, if you get an algorithm into n to the power 10, they say that's a great algorithm, n to the power 10 polynomial time. But more and more so in machine learning and data mining, when you say I have a quadratic algorithm, they will say that it has a moderate use. And one has to really make it scalable, right? So in some sense, in the age of uh, big data, scalability in computing is profoundly important. And it forced people to examine a lot of structure in much more detail to design much better algorithms. Okay, so so with this, I think I I'm timed the recent body. Well, I'm a little three minutes behind my last night rehearsal. So let me just quickly go through a last pro, uh, uh, part of the topic, which essentially also means that once you began to deal with the big data. Clearly, we need to make data small, called a dimensional reduction, and which means we are losing information. And what are we computing? <laughs> Can we justify or at least find the meanings of our solution? So this will be the, uh, I still think it's along the way of theory for heuristics, right? So, <clears throat> so, so let me take a small break and uh, <clears throat> give an overview of uh, a uh, quick overview of so-called cooperative game theory, a very small part. So they basically study group of players, uh, try to form coalitions. You can think about political coalitions, business coalitions, the companies, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> so their data is really big data, right? So you can see people saw board games has been working on big data for a very long time. That's why people like Hans Bolena has always worried about big data because they couldn't search it. And here's another mathematical domain. People think about big data, big model. So their data model for cooperative game is just our set function. That is, uh, for, you have grand <coughs> correlation, and for every subgroup, you have utilities. Let's say empty group has zero, okay? And uh, so this clearly is a big model, and in our KDD language, it's just a weighted hypergraph, okay? And the application, it's quite broad, uh, including po uh, political and business uh, alliance. So, uh, so here is a beautiful dimensional reduction proposed historically by uh, uh, Shapley. So this is called Shapley value. So I like you to see through the lens of dimensional reduction, right? We so far show two examples. Page rank is dimensional reduction of uh, n by n graph to a vector. Eigenvector is dimensional reduction by n by n graph to a vector. This is by two to the n to a vector of length n, right? So, so he said, here is a dimensional reduction. You randomly order 
the, 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 the participants, the, the players, and then you compute the marginal utility. When new people come, you say, what's your marginal utility? Namely, the, the utility before you come and currently. Imagine you have a company already partially formed, and we hire another person, and we want to know, did we grow? And the value of that person at the moment is this margin. So, so Shapley said, let's just take a random expectation and this marginal uh, utility. And uh, when he uh, do this, it's become a vector of length n. So this is massive reduction, right, from 2 to the n to n. And uh, this is what he called expected marginal contribution. And clearly, the solution space as a dimensional reduction went from 2 to the n to n, right? So this is even more aggressive than the spectral reduction, for example. And uh, <clears throat> so his objective is to measure individual contribution to coalition games and for fair allocation. For example, how much should we pay everyone in, in, in the company when people can make a group from new company of certain values, right? So, so, so in many ways, this is the cooperative games page rank. You can think of it that way, right? It's one way to reduce a called centrality, right? What's the centrality of individuals? In this hypergraph, right, you can think of this as a centrality for hypergraph, as one at least competing in the ocean. Sounds very natural. So let's connect with circle back to our first pro illustration I have on the network influence, and let's make a reduction there. You know, I mean, heuristic, I can do anything, right? So let's just apply other people to heuristic to reduce, right? So, <clears throat> so remember, we have a probabilistic model for uh, uh, network influence, a set exactly inf uh, created at the other set. And uh, there's a KKT model to do the spread. So you can reduce them into a spread. What's the value of every group? Then suddenly you have a cooperative game. And so let me call this game the social influence cooperative game. That is, the, each group's value is how much you can influence. Right? So then naturally, one can apply Shapley reduction to get a vector of n to see how important you are in social influence, the centrality in the net network influence. Right? So you can see this is a combination of two early heuristics. One is uh, uh, KKT to say, hey, let's don't talk about probabilistic model. Let's go to a spread model. And secondly, we apply more aggressively into Shapley's one. Right? So <clears throat> this is one way to design heuristics, is to compile other people's heuristics. Right? So this is one way to. So, so what does this mean? What is Shapley value of this game capture? Right? So that's a, a meaningful question. Because if you don't study this, there's other way to define so-called social influence centrality. You have to answer the same question. What, because we reduce the data from dimensionality from exponential to, 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 to linear, right? So, so this is one way to think about the interplay between models, right? Because we have a dynamic model, we have a static model. We used to have some early notion, page rank between this local sphere of influence, that are all defined on graph. And uh, we didn't consider this dynamic. Then how do we measure the in interplay, because the static one, clearly in our mind, is insufficient. Because there's something, when you change the stochastic model, intuitively this should change, right? So, so one way to do this, for example, in Shapley's day, is a beautiful theory they developed called axiomatization. They try to find the, the basic properties that somehow characterize their solution, right? So here is Shapley goes for his valuation. He said, you know, uh, you know, whenever you do reduce, you need to be efficient. Think about salary, right? You have a company, eventually everyone will have a share of a company, and they need to add up equal to the company, because otherwise, what do you do with the actual uh, left or gap, right? So then people say, that's a good property, we should do it efficient. And he asked other people, shall we worry about the uh, people's name? You know, is a particular name is more important than the other one, or if we permute them, the whole thing permute? They said, oh, it should be anonymous. So that's called symmetry. If two <coughs> players have the same profile, they should have the same valuation. That's the second one. The third one is called linearity. He said, suppose we have two companies of same people. We merged into a bigger company, umbrella company. Uh, 
I think we sh everyone's valuation should just add. So, so, so that's the third property uh, he used. The second, fourth one is a, a boundary case. He said, you know, if someone has no value to any subgroup, then the person should have no value, right? So, so he checked his formulation. He satisfied this. And it turned out his solution is unique to this. So this is why this set of four simple axioms represent his theorem, uh, the, the valuation, because it characterizes his valuation. And whether you like his valuation or not, you have to see whether you disagree with Russell or not. Right? This is how, as a mathematician, they think the economic model should be interpreted, interpretable for, for their days. Right? And uh, so, uh, so in a joint work with Wei Chen, we began to try to set up an analog of Shapley's axioms for network influence based on this very simple model, SNT probability model. And uh, so few of the axioms sound very principal that one seems to want to have. Anonymity, you know, it should be invariant under permutation. And uh, 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 normalization, uh, because you don't want to have a different scale. So let's say everyone on average has one. And, uh, and one can also debate whether to have a Bayesian model, namely, when you have a, 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 a Bayesian model of influence, uh, should your uh, centrality should be just based upon the, uh, the, the prior, uh, the, the posterior of this Bayesian distribution, right? And if you disagree, you have to find another solution. So let's say we agree. So this, suppose we have this principled axiom, then <coughs> the other one just almost like Shapley's boundary case. Uh, most, the first two I'm not going to overly highlight is related with uh, uh, independent nodes. If you're isolated from influence, you should just get your own value, one. And, uh, and the other one is related with how a sync node couldn't in interfere with other nodes, okay? But the last one is somehow related with Nash bargaining, which I will come back. It's basically said if you have a group of people can influence one person using and relationship, this and. Just our end relation. Think, how many of you see this movie called Three Men and a Baby? Maybe I'm just too old. <laughs> right? The, the baby's decision depends on the end of three men. <laughs> Maybe not, but, right? So, so that's that scenario. And he said if you have our person decide, this guy uh, has a valuation R over uh, R plus one. So I, I will relate with a little bit of Nash bargain later. So, so we were able to. Uh, essentially follow through uh, the, 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 the Shapley's uh, principal proof to argue that uh, Shapley's centrality for network influence started from the uh, probability model, satisfy all those six M, uh, axioms, and it's also unique. So whether you like his reduction for social influence centrality is one thing, but minimally we can examine those very few basic properties. And you have to disagree with that. And the, the way we try to structure that is the principal one and the choice one. And choice means you can make other choice. And indeed, somehow our theorem proves to be that if you change those valuation, the, 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 the use centrality also change. You can uniquely map back using the other as a linear space. Okay, so, so let me mention a little bit of the last case. Uh, it's, it's related to a very simple case of bargaining. So, so imagine we have two node network. So that's why it, the axiomatization reduced distill into simple cases. Then to say, how do you do? If you do this, you want to use principled axiom to expand the whole space, right? So, so imagine that my daughter has probability P influence me, I have a Q. I think in reality it's like this. I have zero influence to her, right? So. Uh, so now she said, this is importance uh, when you have asymmetries. You, you shouldn't bargain as half and half, right? So for example, in this extreme case, now she said the optimal bargain after a set of axiom of its own is half and a two third, which you, you can think is, is somehow optimization of quadratic function, okay? And uh, the one which we mentioned, uh, the, the one we mentioned for the, oh, sorry. Yeah, I can't quickly go. The one we mentioned, like three men and baby, is just extension of that when you have multiple people to, 
So, uh, since I have three minutes, uh, so I will just mention uh, uh, some. You can see once you, one, you can see axiomatization, they can expand. So, for example, what we didn't like is this three man and the baby scenario because they don't look like a network. They have complementarity. The question is, when you axiomatize, do you have to deal with complementarity? For example, IC model or linear threshold are submodular. They don't have this end relationship. They are all relationship. So, so eventually, we couldn't resolve that. A, a clever student from CMU, I think Vince Cornelius students, uh, Henry, so he eventually managed to prove the war is also a, a choice set. You don't need to use M, you can just use war to set it up. Uh, you're just using war value of the Shapley value to set it up. And uh, so, in fact, he did something more, which is quite striking. He, he said, you know, social influence is not just S to T, it's really this history S to S1 to S2, then finally to T. Right, so social influence is really this profile, right? The cascading sequence profile. So if you think cascading sequence as a profile, clearly at the most n length, and that is a huge space mathematically, but that's really the model of cascading influence. And uh, he said, are there some kind of basis to set up I, uh, the, 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 the uh, centrality? And uh, he actually find the one just based on his proof of war. He said, actually, the, in network, they do broadcasting. You have a group, you can just broadcast to a network. That gives you a sequence of uh, deterministic sequence, not stochastic, deterministic sequence. I give you a group in a direct graph, and particularly in a layered graph. It's well defined. You know, the first layer goes to second layer, to third layer, to fourth layer. So that's become your cascading sequence. And then we set up profile of this type of sequence. And uh, so we were able to prove this uh, BFS propagation profile is actually a mathematical basis of the entire stochastic profile. So this means that actually when we talk a lot about stochastic uh, influence, at least if you believe Bayesian model, the linearity immediately say everything actually is decided by just graph theory. So which means if you set up the so-called centrality for determining the case, the Bayesian model and, and permutation invariant naturally take the whole space. Okay, so, so, so that's why whether you like your local graph centrality, as long as it satisfies certain property of the Bayesian model, they can just be lifted to the stochastic version. Right? So with that, there's many open questions you can see. Heuristic is a big space, and uh, because whenever we interact with outside, what people use outside are heuristics to us. And, you know, in the past, as a theoretician, I always feel, hmm, I'm doing theory. But I think in the end that, you know, there's a lot of wisdom of other people's doing. And they really, you know, if you already think again and again, sometimes one can distill of the principle of your liking, right? That, I think, hopefully will encourage algorithm design, uh, theory design of understanding data and the models, and uh, uh, so, so clearly, you know, even locally for the last set, the play between game theory, scalable algorithm, and network analysis has been, uh, uh, you know, very uh, wonderful space to do. And I don't know how to uh, sum uh, summarize my talk. Let me quote the great Canoes about theory and practice. And uh, um, so, so clearly, uh, many people really learn from outside, right? including our great mind. So with that, thank you very much. So we have time for questions, and I see our esteemed friend, Vipin Kumar, kicking us off with that. Shango, fantastic talk, you know, taking us back to almost four decades or five decades of uh, what the beginning of AI was, heuristic search, which is, which is the, uh, the, the beginning technology, and taking us all the way to the end and uh, connecting to lots of things that are going on today. I, I think there's so much wisdom in your talk that I think we'll have to watch it multiple times to 
to catch all the things. Uh, and I, I think what you've shown is that theory and practice, as the court says right, right, you know, very aptly, they don't have to be treated as two different subjects. They really interplay with each other. And, and the value of all the work that got done by different communities coming together, uh, that sort of uh, pushes the things forward. So my question uh, is, along the same lines, uh, what are your thoughts on, on the, the other revolution that has sort of uh, been going through this community, you know, deep, deep learning revolution, you know, in the sense that 10 years ago, if you came to this meeting, nobody would talk about it. Today, there's hardly any session you won't see a value in it, and, and I see some relevance uh, because that work is quote unquote purely heuristic in the sense that mm -hmm. people, it works, and, and you know, with uh, not as much understanding of, 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 um, of why it works, because it works because it works, and, it, and, and a convincing uh, demonstration of those. But then uh, one of the, uh, one of the, the key mechanism in deep learning is to take the data and turn into a different representation, mm -hmm. which becomes very effective. Right, right, right. Which means the graph is changing. There is a graph at the beginning, and, so, and, there is a, and there is a graph at the end that you're working with. So how do you take some of these uh, lessons learned, the, uh, the wisdom, and, and, and how do you apply them here, and what are sort of the challenges for the theory community, you know, to sort of come back to us and sort of say, hey, look, here are some you know, nuggets that you could learn. I mean, as you have shown, you know, time and again, that these two things, these two communities can interact with each other. So I'll, I'll just uh, wait, you know, watch Right, so, so clearly, you know, the, the deep learning is, it, 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 by now it's a remarkable uh, heuristic that in play in, 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 in practice. It's, it's more so than the simplex algorithm now, right? Uh, but, but it play a very similar role, I, I feel like, to the field of computing, that is suddenly, one have a, a few central uh, mathematical transformation that somehow are able to reshape uh, 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 the, 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 the original data model, right? So you can treat them as a dimensional reduction sometimes, right? Because uh, sometimes it's through deep learning, you uh, contract out certain, you call unnecessary information that hopefully one can identify what is removed. Uh, to, you know, to support, for example, unsupervised learning and so on. But on the other hand, it, 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 it could also be like a densification of uh, uh, data, right? For example, uh, part of the reason I include this uh, personal page rank matrix, just give you to see, is it's a very odd idea that you have this sparse graph, then you have this page rank matrix, which is n by n, right? But, but, but somehow, uh, by making the information uh, clearly there, I didn't lose or uh, it's, a, it's a mathematical transformation. But, but this transformation could also be adding some other model parameters in it, right? So somehow you densify your space, right? Almost like in the mathematical space, they have something called category theory that, uh, you know, they said we couldn't solve a problem here, then we lifted it up. And somehow in that space, it has solutions. Think about the FFT. Right, we try to multiply numbers. Then, then we multiply polynomials, which is a bigger problem. <laughs> right? So somehow, in this, uh, 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 when you change the model into a broader one, and because this new model has other properties, that potentially allow you to have maybe either different, different bases or certain things too. So I, you know, uh, uh, clearly, you know, I myself are very interested in trying to uh, have certain theoretical saying about uh, you know, the, the one of the major activity in our field, but uh, it is, you know, become quite complex. But it requires a lot of domain knowledge sometimes, right? Yeah. So it's humbling, too, because to be able to see certain, see certain elements, yeah. But, but it could be, you know, like, you know, on one side is like reduction consistently to make if either if certain information more magnified. And the other one could be like this category theory type, right? Somehow you lift it up into a better space there has better connectivity in it. Yeah, so. Thank you, that was a wonderful talk. Um, my question is about the, what's the relationship you think between robustness and heuristics? 
because in machine learning and data mining, we are always looking for models that are robust. Mm -hmm. And when you started with the entire premise that you almost know the truth, but for some amount of error, do you think we are trying to go to robustness as a part of that uh, solution? Just so. Yeah, so, 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 so in mathematical theories, it's called condition number analysis, stability analysis, right? So I, I think I forgot to mention to, maybe it's a repeat the other day where you talk about being a chair. I said, you know, when I went to USC to be chair, uh, fortunately, uh, a lot of my colleagues were my cohorts from old days in CMU. I said, they provided me a space to, be, to find robust solutions that somehow hard problems are solved, right? So, so, so in some sense, clearly, when you have robustness, uh, profoundly, your solution space are either more connected or, or, uh, or there's just more so solutions nearby in a particular setting, right? So that's why, for example, even for the, uh, uh, beyond worst case analysis, some of the assumptions was made by the fact that uh, the, the, the output has certain property, namely robust. So for example, there's a beautiful work by uh, uh, Nina Balkin and Aaron Bloom. Uh, I think uh, Santos Van Pala was part of it too. So <clears throat> they're doing the, 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 this uh, uh, output quantification of clustering, right? They said, uh, you, you try to use k-min to cluster, and nobody knows what we are clustering. We just apply the heuristics. But, but they said, if, but if you assume that you believe the approximation of k me, it gets you closer to, uh, you may not like the uh, language of set closeness. There could be other closeness. Then they say, suddenly, your, your input actually has certain mathematical structure because uh, that statement made the problem slightly more robust. So that's why your search becomes easier, right? So, 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 so those could be highly correlated. In, our case, for example, smooth analysis, uh, often, for example, for the multi-objective uh, functions and uh, uh, the steep descent, often it's because when you have a little bit of noise, the winner and loser gap somehow increased. So that's why somehow uh, you can think as a robustness that way, right? Because you don't just marginally win, you win a little bit of bigger margin. That's why this iterative algorithm makes good progress. Right, so it's correlated to that statement, yeah. But, but in large, clearly, there's many other domain settings which I, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great and inspiring talk. And then for your like, inference uh, um, uh, maximization or the graphs, it's mainly about like, uh, social networks and practical graphs. Have you thought about the graph uh, in uh, uh, deep neural networks? And then think about, how we can you know, study this kind of sparseness or this kind of influence maximization and then try to sparsify this like you know, the man-made graphs and then what is the insight or like a difference between studying this kind of graph and the graph you talked about. Thank you. Right, so I, I myself don't have that much experience there. You know, periodically when I go to talk, people mention that a certain way to, uh, for example, make the neural net more concise and so on. And clearly, I, I myself have to learn more about it, but I don't have enough right now mathematical understanding to make, 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 make a reasonable statement of that. But I, I believe it must be you know, fundamentally important because every time you can make a meaningful specification, it not just have an implication to algorithm, right? Clearly, in terms of this principle of multi-level, right, specify is important, right? Because it allows us to build a, a, a chain of possible solutions. But on the other hand, I think specification themselves, just like redu reduction themselves, if one can capture better meanings, they may actually channel other solution concepts. Right? Yeah. yeah so, they, so, they, they do share some kind of similarities between these kind of like uh, of a course, they, they, they do, definitely, yeah. They do, definitely, yeah. So Thanks. it's just, uh, I myself clearly have a limited uh, knowledge on, on many different things. So I, I may not have a, a, a right thing to say right now. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's a question from Jan. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Xiaohua, for a wonderful talk. So I think in general, we really are looking forward research that can actually connect both theories and practices. Uh, I want to use your Shapley value as an example to uh, have a further discussion. So in the Shapley value, 
uh, you talk a little bit about several very nice theoretical properties uh, that uh, about this value. I wonder uh, how many of them or any of them are actually motivated by the empirical observations or studies from social science perspective, uh, or some of them actually purely for uh, theoretical convenience to prove a lot of other properties. And also the second part of the question is, uh, in terms of a lot of the theoretical work, uh, do you have any good examples how we can actually use this theoretical analysis to help knowledge discovery, which is actually uh, one of the major interests of the KDD community? Right, so, 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 so that's a wonderful question. In terms of clearly the Shapley value, the, 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 uh, the theoretical component is very clear, in part because uh, we're just curious on, on this uh, massive dimensional reduction, what can we say about them? So, so in practice, I think the uh, Wei Chen has engaged with quite a few people. They try to see whether there's some quick way to estimate the uh, relevant significance so that in terms of uh, uh, either online or a sort of quick selection of the, uh, 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 the seed set. If they are able to somehow identify quickly of the significance, then they are able to uh, 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 use that as a sort of proxy to, to do the uh, uh, immediate sign of uh, network influence. Uh, but the other part is also is how, when you see the uh, significant formation, is how do you go back to look at your data, right? Because uh, when, when, when you reduce, if maybe they themselves, uh, uh, suppose you have several s different variants of reduce what is important, then it maybe allow you to build multiple facets of this data, even though this original data are exponentially large, right? So that's uh, possibly the other more practically related uh, answer is that you can quickly build multifaceted, uh, succinct multifaceted interpretation of this uh, potentially massive model, right? But, uh, uh, but in great detail, clearly, one needs much more domain uh, interactions to, to see how, whether even those theory are directly relevant or not, right? So, uh, so, so, so but, but, but one thing to understand, for example, there's a ther graph theoretical basis for this thing. Suddenly, it gives us a bigger space to search for uh, possible different uh, uh, answers. Right, because otherwise, it's just a single centrality measure. But if you have family of them, all satisfy this property, then it allows you to distinguish them, but also mm -hmm. study their commonality. Like the principal part is common, and the choice part is different. And the different doesn't mean bad, right? It only means you see differently. So it could just be the fundamental facet of the, uh, this uh, larger dimension. We have time for one more question. Let's go ahead. Okay, first of all, thank you, of course, for the amazing presentation. And at the beginning of this presentation, you were mentioning about many different definitions of heuristics that your colleagues give. I wanted to ask, what is your definition of heuristics? What is my definition of heuristics? Uh, I, I think, uh, first of all, it's uh, something probably we identify as, a, hmm, that's interesting. And, uh, but, but, but it's also ourselves may not feel that we fully understand, right? And uh, so, so that's the first feature usually I consider, you know, it's a, it, 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 when people say, they say that's, uh, it sounds uh, uh, maybe intuitive or sounds uh, reasonable, but on the other hand, when one began to interact, particularly in heuristic, uh, if they have success in certain domain, right? So that, then, uh, in some sense, it's more justified heuristic because they, they actually use that. And maybe that domain knowledge suddenly captures certain structures and uh, informations that are useful to other domains. Uh, so this is uh, why is, if one can talk data mining or non, uh, knowledge discovery, that's what our research is, right? So, so to be able to distill certain properties and could be matching in different other area when are able to build those connections, right? So, so I guess, uh, personally, uh, I do see heuristic as, uh, you know, eventually people 
began to build uh, either partial basis uh, or uh, uh, experimental basis to support that uh, this idea really is natural for this space. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the speaker again. Thank you. It's time for a coffee break before our session starts at 10 a.m. So see you all.